On this episode of Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered, we talk about how to create more value for homeowners, how they can get a higher return on their property, how agents might approach listing presentations differently with additional services. It's going to be an incredible show. Tune in. You talk about it privately. We talk about it publicly. This is the Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered podcast. Welcome again to Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered. I'm your host, James Swiggins, along with my co-host, Keith Robinson, aka Crazy Uncle Keith. Yes, sir. Keith, who's coming on the show? Tell us what we're talking about today. Today, we have Michael Aladawi, the founder and CEO of Revive. And he digs in on some really interesting topics about how we can serve residential real estate clients at the highest level, the kinds of things we should be paying attention to, how we can unlock equity and unlock returns for clients. Uh, how an even, agent might present their services differently in the future as well. It's yep. interesting as too. So. And we touch on what color door gets you the biggest return in residential <laughs> real estate. <laughs> it's going it to be a great, great show. Dive great, in. great, thoughtful conversation on all things real estate from a really smart guy. So you're going to love it, kids. Put it in your ear. Let's go. Michael, welcome to the show. We are so excited to have you here. Uh, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, your views on the industry, some interesting stuff you've been working on. Uh, first, for all of our listeners and viewers, give them a little bit of background on you, where you came from, uh, where you are, your current role today, the company you're at. Go, make it happen. Hey James, thanks. Thank you, Keith, for having me. Of course. Um, yeah, my you know my name is Michael Aladawi, and I I'm I'm gonna say I've, I've listened to two of your episodes. I'm gonna say I I I might have the most diverse background. I, I'm like the ADD of, of 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 career guys. I started my career literally working at the Red Cross. I'm a medical school dropout. Um, I was a broker. I was a lender. Um, I was a, a builder, so I've, I've kind of been all over the place and kind of really extreme. Um, and, and today I'm the CEO of Revive, a company who is basically trying to replace my former flipper self. So, uh, <laughs> so you're so you're a reformed flipper? Is that way? <laughs> I'm a reformed flipper. That's awesome. That's, we got to quote that. That's that's another one of our T-shirts, Keith. Is yes, reformed yes. flipper. We've got or, a bunch of taglines that we're using to to create swag. I think that we're going to do. But, we definitely need merch. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. That's, so, with all that diverse background, um, as you migrated from sort of builder, and you're being pretty humble. I, I know your background a little bit. You've you've been more than just a flipper. You've done some. I guess projects of significance, uh, some some bigger projects and and infill projects and those sorts of things. What made you kind of want to make this radical leap from being a fix and flip ground up construction guy to starting a company that is is a service business really at its core that happens to be around uh, f fixing up properties? Tell me about that mind shift. How'd that happen? Well. Um well, thanks for the the notoriety. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I did flip over a thousand homes between like 2010 and 2013. Yeah, um, so I was I was building like <laughs> 15 homes a year in Southern California. Did you ever I, fight a contractor on the lawn? Oh, <laughs> never, never, of course not. Never. <laughs> did you ever threaten? No, no, just kidding, just kidding. Well, you know, well, the interesting thing is, um, you know, flipping at scale. And that's what really kind of um, inspired me to get into this space because mm. I was building homes from ground up in literally 12 months in Southern California. And then I'd have friends that would call me and say, hey, could you know, I've been remodeling my kitchen for six months. Could you help me? You know, and I'm like, I don't understand. And no one can relate to that. No one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. Um, yeah. And so I, I kind of saw like, hey, what, what am I doing? And when I tried to refer these contractors to my friends, they weren't able to speak the same language. It turns out that the type of contractor I was working with as a professional is someone that doesn't speak consumer mm. and the consumer doesn't speak production level contractor, right? Right. Um, you know, in, in the in the flipping space, you know, when we hire contractors, it was you're a glorified scheduler and manpower. That's right. what you did. <laughs> the investor, flipper, whatever you want to call them or us, is you know doing all of the heavy lifting we're we're analyzing mm -hmm. the deal flow what's a good deal to bring in what isn't 
you know, what's the value add, what's the budget, what's the scope. We're going to hire the architects, the designers, procurements. We're going to get the permits and we're going to say, hey, go. Um, but in the consumer world, not so. And right. so I saw an opportunity to kind of, if you will, uh, do something bigger than what I was doing, mm. um, which is, you know, really democratize home flipping on a national scale and making it possible for the everyday average home seller to be able to bypass the flipper and flip their own home. Hmm. Um, Interesting. So, yeah. Well, I want to dig into that. Let's, I want to get a few rapid fire. Cause we got, a, we got a lot of questions we want to ask yeah. around what you just talked about, but we want to still <laughs> get a little bit of rapid fire on you. So, uh, We'll do these fast, gives people a little bit of understanding on, on uh, who you pick, and then they can be judgy as hell when they give your answers. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Don't be. Don't All be. right. So I'll do the first one. If you were a superhero, who would it be and why? Oh, God. Okay. So I got three kids, three, seven, and nine. So many superheroes nowadays. All the superheroes, yeah. I mean, it, but Thanos isn't a superhero, right? He's a villain. I mean, oh, that's a villain, I, but you can pick but him hey, if ride you with want. It, ride like, with it. Ride I, with I want it. an Infinity Stone yeah. because I want to reset time. You know, yeah. I want to okay. go back in time, start over. So Thanos. <laughs> so Thanos. So Thanos. Yeah. All right, yeah. that's a that's a good one. That's All right, our, now we are definitely going to have some judgy as hell people on that, that one. Good. So good, let yeah. him judge. That's our first villain, and I'm here for it. That was yeah. really good. All right, next rapid fire question: favorite book, Audible or podcast that you've read in the last year, or that you listen to reread every year, and why? I mean, seriously, do you think the CEO of a startup has time to read or anything <laughs> like that? Like <laughs> this <laughs> podcast on your way to the office, baby. Um, okay, so I think uh, other than this one, of course, this might be a little. Yes, of course, uh, this may be mainstream, but I love the book, The Infinite Games by Simon Sinek, focusing mm. on the why. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's that's kind of a book that's resonated with me a lot. And yeah. Um, yeah. Infinite it's important. One. It's a good book for it, just the concept of understanding your why is like something everybody should spend time on. Yeah, um, I think it's a great. I actually saw Simon Sinek speak once. He's really, really amazing to watch. Very, very uh, interesting guy to listen to about his views on things. Yeah, um, interestingly, too, it, it kind of ties lot, back. And I, oh, go ahead. It's a it's a lot easier. It's a lot harder than it sounds, right? The why. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you know, sure. way harder. Well, it's yeah. also evolving. You feel like your why changes as companies mature. But well, well right. Sure. Or you started as a flipper, infill, ground up guy. Yeah. And that wasn't yeah. enough, right? That didn't feed your why. So then you start yeah. a whole company around that concept or product. Uh, okay. Last question, James. Hit him. Uh, you could have lunch with one person, current or historical. Who would it be? And more importantly, why? We always like this question because it just tells a lot about yeah. someone. Yeah, this this is a hard question, and I think if I could choose any one person, I, I I'd have to go. I'm not like a. I'd have to go biblical on you, you know. Nope. I'd, I'd have okay. to say, do it. I'd have to say, you know, Jesus. Cause can yeah. I say that? You know, you like can. you can say whatever you want. Yeah, you yeah. Say one person, Adam, Eve, Jesus. I pick. I pick Jesus. I'd want to meet this man. You know. Okay. Yeah. That's a great. That's a good one. Yeah. 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 I, if, yeah, I'd have a list of questions. So <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. I'm that's pure key to have like a, yeah. literally a list of questions as no, long as the Bible. That's, that's so, a good yeah. one. That's a yeah. good one. That's awesome. All right, cool. So uh, dive ahead, us Jim. in, Keith. No, take us into the first com some questions. I know so we want to. You highlighted a little bit, um, sort of this this concept of of lowering the bar and making. I, you called it flipping. I, I may put a little different phrasing around it. You tell me if this feels right, but uh, okay. getting your property ready to sell, right? It's sort of that thing we all know we're supposed to do. I remember uh, as a kid, my parents painting the house uh, inside and out, you know, for, for weeks we had projects that I was forced to do as child labor, which is illegal, mom and dad, if you're listening, <laughs> illegal. Um, and <clears throat> our house never looked better than the day we sold it. Right. I was like, dang, this place looks kind of great. Like, why don't we stay? So you're trying to democratize that process. Why doesn't everyone do it? Like, what's the gate? We all know if the house is ready to show the, the closer it gets to perfect, the better, the more offers, the more interest, all of it. And I want to know what percentage, by the way, of like just how many people Ooh. do it and <clears throat> just like what's the percentage increase of if you do it versus not. Because I think it's a really fascinating conversation of yeah. 
how much yeah. money is potentially lost on the table. So high level, why doesn't everyone do it? And then brass tax, like, well, how does that translate? How does doing it translate to a benefit to the homeowner? Yeah. Well, well, first, let me say every home, I think, um, needs something. And they fall into two categories that mm. like value preservation or value adding. Right. Like you could almost your house could be perfect. Right. You just got to clean it up, maybe just paint it. Or if it's got a leaky sink or a leaky roof, these are value preservation things that people should just do not mm. to add value, but just preserve the, the value. The little and things that have annoyed you about the house while you've lived there, right? Yeah. I mean, or your, your to do list, your weekend yeah, handy yeah. list. Yeah. Um, and then there's like value add things like updating kitchens, bathrooms, floors. These are like major value add components. So I, I think all homes have one of those two things uh, that they need. And, and you know, 76 percent. Um, I don't know. And I, I know how you feel about percentages because I listened to the last <laughs> part. We think they're all made up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But um, I read on Google somewhere. There you go. Must be true. (laughs) Um, But the majority of people, and I think you guys will relate to this, they don't make home improvements or necessary upgrades to their homes when selling. And I think the main reason is fear, Mm. anxiety, because we've all had a bad experience. We know someone that's had a bad experience. I mean, crap, I'm in the industry and I've had a bad experience, right? Yeah. Because you always kind of hear people going budget double and budget twice as long. It's a hassle. People are in your house. Yeah. You know, yeah. And if you think about it, when you're when you're going to sell your home, whether you're like a realtor or a home seller, the last thing you want to do is take on a project that has no end in sight, potentially, right? <laughs> right. It, it, you know, you don't want to do that. So so you kind of just do the bare minimum. Um, and, and you know, another thing that I don't hear enough people talking about is the access to to the skilled labor force and these contractors. I mean, these guys are dying breed, you know, so it's getting harder and harder to just find someone. I mean, you know, the company I'm running now, Revive, spends so much time just finding people that are reliable, that want jobs. I mean, there's so many, contra- like in Tennessee, you, you we spent like months calling hundreds of people, don't need extra work, don't right. want extra work. It's like, what? Yeah. yeah, they were having yeah. that problem. So after the last, you know, downturn, they were having that problem. So everybody got out of the trade. Obviously, there were no job. Nobody was building houses for four years. Um, it was interesting, is, uh, and this, I'm just kind of correlating this here, was when the iBuyers were, were doing this, buying property, cleaning them up and flipping them, one of the biggest problems they had was essentially shortening up their carrying time, how mm-hmm. long they're carrying those properties on the books because they couldn't get the work done and finding labor to do it and then deal with that and then at a rate where they're trying to put pressure on the contractors to do a job at a fee that they can afford and you know there's a there's all these metrics in it so it's i i've heard many people tell me that it's only getting worse as the labor market just you yeah, know, skilled labor did, becomes harder yeah. Pandemic didn't help either, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, when it some people stopped and were like, "Oh, maybe I should retire now," and then everyone turned the key back on at the same time, so you had massive demand for skilled labor. But I mean, you know, like it's not like kids today are like, "I want to be a plumber," right? You know, <laughs> like I want to be an electrician, or I want to be a framer. Like kids aren't they? They want to be in, uh, Instagram models or something. I don't know. They want to <laughs> do a podcast. Yeah, they want to do a podcast. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, an influencer. But yeah, so, so, so back I think to that, fear and anxiety. Back to that getting it ready. So fear and anxiety for sure. Um, mm-hmm. and, and overcoming that, right? So sort of being a helmet law for that process, I think is important. Whether you're working with a company or you're doing it as a real estate professional, you have to know that uh, that's, that's a big component of it. What are the parts of the home that when you invest in it, you get the most back. I know everyone's curious about this, right? So like, I imagine if I put on a new roof, that's not super sexy. No one's that excited about a roof. So what are the most dollar additive? I don't know if I'm using that word correctly, but what are the most dollar additive uh, to that a, a, a homeowner can make before they take their home to market? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, look, I mean, that's kind of what I, what I, what I did for so long, yeah, right? That's what I'm asking. Like, yeah. You know, at the core of every, every investment that a, a flipper or an investor makes, um, and hopefully now home sellers get to assess is what's the value of this asset as it is mm-hmm. and what's the neighborhood potential, right? Because 
that question is kind of a loaded question because there's not a one answer fits all, right? Like, yeah, sure. Roofs aren't mm -hmm. value, add, they're value preservation, not value right. add. So yeah. when we go, what's the highest ROI? Well, sure, you know, the, one of the cheapest things you could do is paint and stage a house. You know, those right. are very high ROI items, um, but updating your kitchens and bathrooms and floors, that's kind of like big ROI, but depends on the neighborhood, right? right. Like, um, you know, I, I have a friend right now who's buying a home in Huntington Harbor here in Southern California, and it's straight out of the 90s, but they're older, and they think it's amazing, you know, right, you're but, right. but that entire community is a retirement community. So if if an, if you go in there and look, hey, people who update their kitchens from the 2000s and 90s in this neighborhood may not have as high of an ROI as in the port streets where everybody has the like the white, you know, modern amenities. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, Do you do mm -hmm. you see a time where we're going to store that kind of data? Like you're going to aggregate that data and, and agents will be armed with that information of like, hey, this is a listing coming up in this neighborhood. We all know the 90s called. They want their tile back. <laughs> so like, yeah. is it yeah. they come in in a different approach of a presentation eventually very specific to that yeah, neighborhood? 100%. And one of the things I'm kind of most excited about a project I'm working on is, is – uh, a, like a computer vision project that actually does exactly that, which is, you know, looks at, you know, mm. market, uh, localized market trends, uh, looks at conditions of homes, uh, grades them, um, and kind of comes up with uh, a kind of a, a plan for a, a seller or an investor or a homeowner thinking about making upgrades, what upgrades should they make and how they're going to impact. So them. I want to frame that. So they're they're going out, of, let's just say long term, this is in play. This is one of the questions I want to ask is how like sort of you can visualize a house mm -hmm. online. The agent comes in, they do a presentation, the normal presentation they do. This is what the price of the house is worth. By the way, here's how the house could look. Here's what we think it would take from an investment perspective and what needs to be done to make this house even more valuable. And here's the return that you can receive by doing that. And here's my team. Is that your vision of what you think it will end up like? I mean, the, the an, yeah, well, the answer is the answer is real estate agents have really had the ability to do that for some time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you really think about it, realtors have been kind of like guiding their clients and should have been guiding their clients in that direction for, you know, they're the guides. And um, it, we just don't see it in residential. The question really for me is having this knowledge as a realtor or having resources that they could tap into to do it, why don't they do that today? Like, why doesn't every realtor go into a listing and say, hey, by the way, your house is worth you know this much and it could be worth this much these are the things that we would want to do and i'm not saying realtors don't do that well most they, don't <laughs> really, yeah james is most, saying <laughs> i am saying that yeah. so yeah and i, I yeah. think that the, the it's kind of like the same question before like why don't homeowners do it mm. well realtors also are afraid not only of you know taking on you know an open-ended project but also they're afraid about how to pitch it and how it will sound to their clients. Yeah, and it's complex. And what if the contractor takes you know, forever? If, if I'm the referral the and I mm -hmm. give them the contractor, yeah. what if they screw up? Or like you're adding, you're not wrong. It should be a discussion. James but, is right. M m m some do, most don't. But they also don't have a way to visualize it. And I think that's an interesting thing you're talking about. If I yeah. was able to show somebody like here, is visually you're now getting them to visually see it so going. james uh, so somebody write the, uh, let's let's mark this part of the pod oh, james is into the iron man goggles for visualization right so the google goggles this, yeah. this would be a way in which apple. you could yeah sure all of them are gonna have it soon <laughs> enough uh the apple goggles so this device ever the, anyways <laughs> But you're yeah. just talking about a perfect use case. I don't know about a goggle, but like something to show them visually, like here's what your house would look like. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. let's go with the ski goggles for yeah. sure. Let's right. see that. You put yeah. that on and you could actually see what your home could look like. And then you could have like, you could have prices for things that you could change just popping up as they look around. Like, is that where, could it get to the point maybe where you don't even have to do the repair? You could create well, that, the experience for the that was my next question for the future buyer right where the hey buyer we're not going to do it 
but we could take it out of the proceeds or whatever, but put on these fancy goggles and we'll show you what this house could look like if you wanted to. You think we'll ever get that far? Yeah. So, so I, you know, just to kind of uh, close the loop on James's uh, question and it ties yeah. into yours, which is, um, yes, I think the future is here. I think computer vision has been here for a while and you're, mm-hmm. we're all seeing this like hockey stick thing going on with AI and integration into as many things as possible. Um, and, and yeah, so I definitely think you're going to see a lot more, you know, better AI tools to help predict um, the current value of a home based on actual conditions, right? Which is the, the project that I told you about, uh, James, earlier, um, which is kind of the what I'm so excited about. Um, helping, you know, helping a realtor not just be able to talk about something, but a curated experience where it's mm. based in empirical like data, like here's the condition of your home, like not just what I think, but like here's the empirical data based on the analysis of your kitchen versus your neighbor's kitchen. Um, so you know yeah. who is doing that, Michael, by the way? I don't know if you ever looked this up. So before Zillow shut down their iBuying, Mm -hmm. They had, I don't remember who told me this. I was somewhere, some drink. I swear to God, I'm not making this up, but they had. Make sure you didn't sign an NDA. (laughs) Probably violating it. Whatever. Uh, They shut that division down anyway. (laughs) They were doing an analysis and, you know, Zillow has massive amounts of data, like more than anyone. They were doing a very detailed sort of like machine learning analysis on all of the homes that they purchased they would play with paint colors. Yeah. They would play with tile types. They went down to the extent, I'm not making this up, of the color of the bedspread in the property when it was staged to show people, th- they were seeing what actually garnered more eyeballs and a higher sales price. I remember they, they had an article that said, I don't know, was, uh, whatever colored front door, I think it was red, yes. sells for 13% more than any other front yeah. door color, right? Yeah. 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 It was yeah. fascinating to 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 look at that going, holy shit, like I that makes sense. Like, you know, if you come in and there's a floral covered bed cover that like I'm going that's hideous. <laughs> I'm now having this like experience versus I have a lot. <laughs> what do you got against Florida? Stop being so judgy, Keith. <laughs> just using it as an example. Okay. Uh, but it was just fascinating. So that your your idea of data is my point. Like yeah. it's yeah, it's yeah. it's empirical data to show them this is what can happen. Um, I think is huge. 100%. Yeah, I, I also I, think. Go ahead. I, I also think uh, Keith. Um, no, I don't think that all of these augmented reality is going to replace the experience because you know when you're selling a home it's well when you're buying a home it's a very emotional thing and seeing what it could look like and actually experiencing it are two different things so i think for sellers and for investors it's great to see like hey this is the direction we want to go in but i think to get the maximum roi on that you got to build the experience i agree yeah you it's better than doing nothing, right? So, mm-hmm. but you can't, there's a reason concerts on YouTube aren't as fun as concerts in person, For sure. right? There's a yeah. shared human experience that you have when I, I, I've shown buyers who we've walked into the front door, they grab my arm and say, Keith, this is our house. And I say to them, well, would you like to see the master bedroom before we write the offer? <laughs> like there, we're in the entryway, but something yeah. about the pheromones, the street, the, <laughs> I don't know what is happening, but I swear to you, it's happened yeah, multiple times. They, yeah. they, it, it, whether that street reminds them of the street they grew up on or something in the entryway triggers. Now they still, sometimes if you go see the master and it's a train wreck and then they, they may get less interested, but it is this for such a big and important decision it's oddly guttural right it is this re- it's this emotional response feedback loop that that buyers have but i'm going to go different with you on this sorry i'm going to debate him now michael's hold on a second yeah, because yeah. like well, how many people I'm sip my coffee how many, how many people walk into a house and they they to i think it's one more on maybe michael's standpoint on this of like they don't actually know what the thing can be because it looks like shit because it's the sure. 90s and the ability to see what it can be gets them to go, oh, like, because I can't get past the gold shower, like, or whatever. Um, you know? Yeah, I, I think it will help. 
it's like I said, the virtual experience of of not seeing the gold shower and seeing the beautiful inlaid Carrera marble and all that happy stuff, right, is better than nothing. It's better than just the ugly gold shower, but nothing is better than walking in and seeing it, hearing yeah. it, yeah. feeling it. You just can't replace yeah. that experience of standing in the room, even if you're standing in the room with uh, with with Iron Man goggles on. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I can't really agree with you more, Keith. I also think that your analogy of the the YouTube, or sorry, the the concert Zoom on YouTube. Concert, that's, yeah. that's a that's a really good analogy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we're we're used to shared human experiences, right? Like we just yeah. are. So, so do you think, Michael? That let me play this out. So, I've been a big proponent that our industry has to evolve. An agent's job has to change, not. Let me rephrase that. Not that we don't do what we're doing. We need to do more. (laughs) Um, We need to provide more value. Like we're transactional and then our industry is awful at follow up beyond that. So like Keith and I have been on this idea for a long time about an agent really needs to be the center point of contact, the advisor, the the person who's helping this homeowner for the time in which they meet to the time in which they sell that house again. So like I had this vision of, you know, people say I buy and went away. I do think it's gone away in the fashion it was, but I firmly believe that I buy needs to come back in the sense of an agent goes to a listing presentation. They present, here's what I can get you on the open market. I'm playing all this together here. Here's what your home is currently worth today based upon its current condition. Here's a cash offer I can get you from an institutional buyer to you know, it's going to be discounted, but there's there's no negotiation, there's no marketing. We don't have anybody walking through your house. Like no it's open just, houses. It's no open just houses. We're just here's the cash, and we're out, and you're done. A sell it tonight price. And then what I love about what you're doing is the third component of, right. and here's the third option. We can here's the data to show you that if we were to do twenty thousand dollars worth of remodel, I'm whatever the number is. We can get you potentially seventy-five to a hundred thousand more in value on this property. I have three directions that we can go. Right now, agents are only doing one direction for the most part. They've got this one thing that they do. Not everybody, but most. Versus now, I've got three options, and you're giving the homeowner choice. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> I definitely think every realtor should come to the table prepared for all of these scenarios and you know i buying um th- that's and i know you you speak about this passionately you know um i i buying it was it, there's kind of a need for it, but it's kind of a horrible idea right like buying a home for five percent off and then just selling it what happens when you know the bottom falls out and you can't pivot enough um, well, that's their business I, model. Well, I think it's good saw, for the homeowner. We but, saw yeah. that happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Saw that. I think there's, saw that I want to clarify just some, I think it's good for homeowners to have choice because there are circumstances, divorce as an example, where they just, it just needs to get done without the hassles. I'm not, to be clear, I'm yeah. not saying it's a horrible business model. Well, it was a horrible business model, but that'll get fixed. So. But, but, you know, the people that were left out of that eye buying um, experience are people that had homes that had significant need for upgrades, right? Because the mm-hmm. eye buyer buy box, they, they were kind of like, if your home needs, you know, if it's ready, to just buy and put back on the market for 20000 or less and strategic upgrades, we'll do it. But if it needed 100000 that's not a house that they were interested in buying. Right, and right. those are the homes and clients that were kind of leaving the money on the table. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yes, I think that um, realtors should come to the table with a plan. And I think you're alluding to, you know, one of one of the products that Revive actually offers, which is, hey, we'll act like an eye buyer, but we'll profit share in the upside of your home after some strategic uh, pre-sale renovation. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, so, we tell us a little bit about it. Cause I think this is an interesting direction you guys are are moving and how this benefits everybody technically. Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, so, you know, our goal at Revive is to drive more renovations in general. And our, mm-hmm. our, our first product, which is, hey, let's partner with realtors because they're at the center of a transaction. They could add more value, maximize the, the listing value of for their clients. That's a great product. But then we were meeting a lot of agents and homeowners that had to sell right away, that were in pre-foreclosure, that had issues that prohibited them from actually maximizing that value. 
Um, and so they were looking at, you know, selling their homes to a flipper maybe, or to uh, we'll buy your ugly home for cash. And so we kind of thought, how could we drive more renovations and help the, the, the seller? Um, and it's like, well, how about we just buy your house, perform those pre-sale renovations, and then share in that profit with you. Um, and so that's what this product is around. And the nice thing is we've kept the, the realtor at the center of it by saying, you know, you can have, you know, you could be on the transaction one and now transaction two. Um, and it's kind of like a win-win for everybody. Well, Keith and I have been very vocal <laughs> about how companies <laughs> who try to remove the realtor from the process yeah, end up doesn't work. failing like a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Um, I like that you're thinking about this from, so essentially you buy the house, do the renovations, and then everybody benefits on the upswing in that particular example, correct? That's right, yeah. I mean, the, the seller is obviously, you know, getting us a, a second check that they would not have otherwise got if they had sold to an I buyer type or an investor yeah. only type. Um, they get an equity the stake with you, uh, they get an equity stake with you on the up leg exit, right? Yeah, the way this yeah. program works is they literally get all of the profits minus 6%. So there's like a gotcha. 6% program fee and they get all the upside. The realtor's selling it again at the higher value. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really a great tool that was kind of born out of just the need of, of what we're seeing today. People have equity, but poor cash flow. Um, and is that also because then it solves the issue of having to deal with all the renovations while somebody's still there? Yep. Like they don't want to deal with the contractor and all the shit that goes along with that. So it's like, look, we'll buy it, we'll get you out, and then you'll benefit on the other side of it. I mean, it seems to solve a lot of, I don't know why anybody hasn't thought of this before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'll tell you why people haven't thought of it. And it's not that they haven't. It's just that the, I it's think, this is my opinion, and I'm not just saying this because that, you know, the hardest part is like getting these renovations done fast, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and that's why, you know, the open doors and, and the Zillow's and the red fins and all the other I buyers, they're, they're pretty smart to not want to take on these, this can of worms that like has no end in sight. And that's yeah, kind of like where, buy box. bigger projects. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so maybe our buy box is a lot smaller, but it's definitely the bigger value add buy box. Um, well, it's the underserved buy box too, right? It's definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And so I, I think the reason people don't do it is because having, you know, um, renovating these things are hard. And, and by the way, I didn't talk a lot about, you know, the, the way that we do this is pretty crazy. We've literally <laughs> built a whole infrastructure for contractors so that, so that they could kind of act the way that they did when I hired them, which is just do one thing, just schedule mm -hmm. the thing. Right. You know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So where do you see, where do you see technology playing into this and going over the next five years? I mean, we're obviously in this really weird market, but there's been a lot of prop tech innovation. Then it slowed to pretty much a standstill. Now it's starting to come back. You know, what is your projection of sort of this this tech and the realtor and the crossroads between all of that and AI over the next five years? I mean, you're yeah, obviously what you obviously have a lot of this. What do you think is going to be the biggest change in the next five yeah. years? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we touched on it a little bit. I think that AI integration into all things real estate is going to be huge. I think that, you know, from where I'm standing, the, just the renovation planning, the strategic mm. planning aspect, right? Because so much of making those decisions is rooted in what's possible, uh, what do we have today, and automating that. I mean, just think of all of the... Uh, of the people out there that are trying to evaluate hundreds of deals, like how do you do that consistently? Or even on an individual basis, um, how do you how do you know like the questions that you're asking? Like if I upgrade this in this neighborhood, what is the return it's going to get me? Is that mm -hmm. the trend here? Um, so I think from that perspective, you're going to see a lot of um, efficiencies being built. Um, and beyond the renovation space, I think um, again. I think a lot of AI integrations, think of how, you know, the financial uh, loan processes could change, how title, mm -hmm. escrow. I mean, I think here's here's a good um, little sound bite. I think if real estate was a car, specifically residential, 
it would be a pinto, right? Like it's it's kind of crazy the the level of innovation that hasn't happened and these basic yeah. things like escrow and title. And I know we're seeing some of it. There's there has been a lot of innovation, but not That's quite an as explosive much as we comment. Could. Ah, see yeah. what he did explosive <laughs> comment because pintos used to blow up a lot that was really good oh, yeah. that was good right. we should have a podcast uh, yeah yeah no i think so, you're right i mean I, it's funny the it took us a decade as an industry to fully adopt docusign <laughs> right or, or, yeah. or mobile signature right like it took yeah. us a decade and there's still that's, people that don't <laughs> right that's crazy yeah. Uh, yeah and qr codes came and went in a weekend right and now they're back again so like yeah. we have this odd sort of add effect with technology and slow to adopt and i agree mm. with you i think the pace of what i heard you say i'm not saying you said this but what i heard you say is the biggest change over the next five years will be the pace of change with technology mm. and and that will mean that we're gonna need to get better at adopting plugging things in because it's only going to speed up for our industry I also I think the role of the realtor is going to have to continue to evolve and, mm -hmm. and and expand into other things. I think it's really interesting to hear how there's so you know between this and some of the other shows that we've done, just sort of you're starting to see shapes of what realtors could be adding into their yeah. their conversations. All well, right, Keith, take us home. I know we've right, got last question. This is what we yeah. always end with, um, Michael. If you were a real estate agent, what is the one thing you do or add to your business today, like right now, to make a difference, to to propel your business forward? If I was a, a real estate agent today, I think what I would do is, well, number one, embrace the technology because it isn't going to replace you. In fact, it's going to make you more mm -hmm. valuable because right. as things become more automated, there there needs to be a balance of the human element to, to that you know, transaction. And so I think embrace it. Don't be afraid of it. Use it to your advantage. And I would say focus on partnerships, right? Um, there is, there mm. is, there are hundreds of companies out there literally killing themselves to provide <laughs> some type of value. So, right. you know, go seek them out and build true partnerships with them. I mean, in essence, what I'm saying is strive to be more than just a real estate agent. I would add, you know, aim to add to, uh, I would aim to just be more val a value creator is yeah. what I would aim to yeah. be. Provide massive value yeah. on anything uh, that touches the home, right? Yeah. I love it. I think it's great. great. Yep. Michael, thanks so much for being on the show today. We really appreciate your insights and uh, it's interesting growth in new sectors of the business. We'll look forward to having you back at some point in the future too. So real, real estate tech is a pinto. You heard it here first. <laughs> that is another t-shirt. <laughs> that was Thanks, awesome. I really Thanks, appreciate Michael. it. Thank of you. Course. See you soon. We need you to subscribe to this podcast because you need us to keep saying the things that nobody else will say out loud.